Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek, uh, Thomas Jefferson scholar, philosopher, and historian. And uh, I'd like to talk to you today in another episode of The Real Thomas Jefferson, a show that essays to uh, answer the question, what would Jefferson be like? Uh, what would we know about Thomas Jefferson if he was stripped of um, the sort of veil put on him by revisionist progressivists and uh, and uh, postmodernists and so forth. That seems to be very much in vogue today when doing Jeffersonian scholarship. Today I wanna to talk to you about um, Jefferson's relationship with Sally Hemings is presumably fairly well discussed today. And if you know me, I, I certainly don't believe that there was a relationship. I think that's a hoax that uh, is uh, perpetrated by th the Thomas Jefferson Foundation at, at uh, Monticello and even at Poplar Forest today. They fall in need of Monticello unquestionably, unswervingly, as if there's a, uh, there can be no doubt about the, the narrative that, uh, that the foundation establishes. So today I want to talk to you about, you know, talk about Sally Hemings all the time. I don't think that ever happened. I want to talk to you today about uh, Sally Hemings' brother, James Hemings. And the title of the talk will be Thomas Jefferson's Raucous Relationship with James Hemings. Now, Jefferson, and let me um, pull something up here, um, had a Residence in France, he had several residences. He had a residence at um, Hotel um, Languioc, Hotel Landron first, which is on this map right with that blue. So that's north of pretty much here's the uh, the main island in, in Paris and pretty much just roughly due north of, uh, in, of Paris. And later Jefferson would move to Hotel de Languioc. Uh, Longiac was located, as you can see from the picture, in the west outskirts of Paris, right? We have uh, the Palais du uh, Louis the uh, 15th um, and um, all sorts of things. And his children were schooled at this blue dot down here um, at a convent. And so I want to get at, let me close this off and, and return to, uh, in back, you'll see uh, the Hotel Languiac, where Jefferson resided at the north northwest part, at the west northwest part of Paris. I want to talk about his relationship with James Hemings, and I think this is a particularly uh, raucous and tumultuous relationship. Now, he was there uh, as Minister Plenipotentiary to France from 1784 to 1789, right? And in 1785, he you know settles down at uh, Hotel Languiac. Now, while he settles in, there's no chef de cuisine at either one of his residences. He's got no one to cook from, in other words. So he employs a trateur. Trateur is a caterer, a fellow by the name of, of Cambo. Now, on uh, November 16, 1784, uh, early on in his residency in Paris, he writes in his memorandum book of 1784, uh, paid the trator 150 francs, being the half of what I am to pay him for teaching James, the other half to be paid when he was taken away. Now, what this means is that James Hemings is being trained trained to be uh, a, a gourmet cook in specializing in French cuisine, okay? Now, Jefferson's residences, uh, especially the one in, in Languiac, are fully staffed. He, he doesn't need James Hemings to attend to him. He's got a number of people there at the residence that'll take care of him and Manners and, and other people. Uh, uh, that will stay with him. Now, um, Hemings will study under one of the chefs at the kitchen, the Prince de Condé. The prince's name is Louis Joseph de Bourbon. And um, the apprenticeship is fairly expensive. Uh, Jefferson uh, is 
in, is uh, enjoined to pay 1,200 francs per year or 200 francs per month. Now, 200 francs per month or 20, you know, obviously is going to be 2,400 francs per year if the apprenticeship lasts a year. Jefferson is entirely unhappy with that um, with that offer because um, it turns out that uh, the person with whom he'll be apprenticed, under whom he'll be apprenticed, will be earning from Jefferson more than the prince, Louis-Joseph de Bourbon, pays uh, his chef. So at some point, he gets sufficiently schooled in French cuisine. And in 1787, James Hemmings assumes the role of chef de cuisine at Hotel Languerre. Now, James will have certain difficulties while he's in France. He's in, there for the whole entire tenure, Jefferson's entire tenure. The first of which is difficulties with the French language. Jefferson writes to Antonio Giannini on February 5, 1786. He writes, he, James, has forgot how to speak English and not learned to speak French. Uh, so Jefferson finds a tutor, a certain Perot, um, for Hemmings, and Hemmings agrees to pay from his own salary for certain instructions in the French language speaking French, conversational French, and grammar as well. Okay, now when you go to Monticello's webpage uh, and you look up James Hemmings, you hear James Hemmings, you hear nothing of Hemmings' difficulties. They just mentioned that his fluidity uh, um, with the French language certain, certainly helped him along while he was in Paris. They talked nothing about his difficulties in learning how to speak the language. So. Um, you know, you certainly get a bias account from most people. Now, on January 9, 1789, and 1789, later in the year, is the year in which Jefferson would leave, Perot writes Jefferson to complain about abuse at the hands of Hemmings. Now, he's paying 24 livres uh, for grammatical lessons for a 20-month period. Um, and he comes to Jefferson's residence to complain and to demand payment for the tutorial in French. Jefferson presumably is not around, so Perot goes to uh, Adrien Petit, who is uh, Jefferson's uh, uh, ma ma maître d'hôtel, uh, the person who arranges all of Jefferson's affairs, and he talks of uh, you know getting retribution, getting monetary retribution from James, and uh, he runs into James, and James gets angry, beats um, Perot, and uh, tears his coat. And Perot complains, he grouses that, you know, I don't have a coat now to, uh, in which I can go about during the winter. Now, we don't know whether Jefferson compensated um, Perot for the coat, uh, whether he paid what... Um, Hemmings owed Perot for the lessons. We have no records of it, so we just, I assume that he did it. Okay? So that, he had difficulties with the language. What? No, number two, he was a nuisance while he was in Paris. That is obvious from the way that he accosted uh, Perot. You know, when he de Perot demanded money for his French lessons, but he had health problems as soon as it gets there, right? He suffered a lengthy illness while he was in Paris. The, the disclosure of that illness is, is not known. Um, but it costs Jefferson over 200 francs to attend to the medical bills of James Hemmings. So he is a financial ability in some sense, as well as someone with, as I have already shown that, someone with a violent temper a um, mercurial disposition where you could be placid and calm at one instance and fly into rage at another instance. An another uh, thing we know about Hemmings is, and this is uh, speculation here, he probably learned of the illegality of slavery while he was in Paris, in which case that would have been, you know, we get... Um, Madison Hemmings always talking about his mother learning of this. And uh, when she came a couple of years into Jefferson's tenure, two and a half years or so, and bargaining with Jefferson, I don't think that ever happened. 
I think that's just complete fabrication. But I think it's quite possible that uh, James Hemmings, when he picked up, he was 19 when he came there, when he learned of the illegality of slavery, that he might have used that as a bargaining tool with Jefferson, because Jefferson will at some point later on free him. Okay. So what's interesting at this point to me is that there's no question that James is a bit of a pest. And yet Jefferson had to know about this prior to him taking James with him to Paris. So why does Jefferson insist on taking someone? His lack of facility with the French language might be an indication that he's somehow cognitively disadvantaged. Might not be, but it just could be that he's had problems with French. Um, or it could be that he just doesn't care to learn the language and he's not so interested in learning in general. We don't know. All right, so when Jefferson goes back to the United States, back to Virginia, and then he's serving as a, a, a Secretary of State in George Washington's administration, he, in Philadelphia, James comes to Philadelphia with him and winds up being Jefferson's personal chef. Right. And um, James will resign that post at year's end. Now, while in Philadelphia, what we know is that James confronts Thomas Jefferson and asks that he be given allowed his freedom. Right. And so Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, draws up the following formal agreement to the fact that I'll read it verbatim. Having been at great expense and having James Hemings taught the art of cookery, Desiring to befriend him and to require from him as little in return as possible, I do hereby promise and declare that if the said James shall go with me to Monticello in the course of the ensuing winter, when I go to reside there myself, and shall, shall there continue until she, he shall have taught such a person as I shall place under him for that purpose to be a good cook, this previous condition being performed, he shall be thereupon made free. And I will thereupon execute all proper instruments to make him free. Given my hand and seal in the county of Philadelphia and state of Pennsylvania, this 15th day of September, 1793. So September 1793, Jefferson signs, seals, made it uh, official. James Hemings is a free man. Now Jefferson, as I've mentioned before several times, was not want to free anyone unless the person was sufficiently light-skinned to pass for white and had a particular skill that would transfer wealth wherever to wherever the person moved. That said, you know, why is that the case? Is Jefferson just, you know, picky? No, I, I think he was just concerned that a freed person have somewhere to go and have an opportunity to make a, a viable living. Okay. So Hemings is free. Now, if we go back to the letter, he says, having been at great expense to teach him cooking, cost me a lot of money, time, patience, probably part of the expense, desiring to befriend him and to require from him as little in return as possible. So Jefferson is, is saying, basically, uh, this might be an admission that James is a pain in the ass, that um that Jefferson has put out great expense, tried to befriend the person, and yet the person is not reciprocating, is not doing what Jefferson asks him to do, not returning the friendship in the way that he wants it. Certainly, it's not going to be a friendship among equals for Jefferson. But anyways, James is freed and, and thereby enabled to pursue his own course of activity. James subsequently for in a few years, winds up training his younger brother, Peter, right, to be the cook at Monticello. And James is freed in that later that year in 19, in 1796. Now, what does Hemings do thereafter, right? He travels and he finds work wherever he goes because he does have uh, expertise as a French chef. And I'm sure that would be a very valuable asset. And James certainly knows this, that wherever he goes, you know, they're not going to have a French chef or someone expert in French cuisine. So he might have gone back to France. We don't know. 
Uh, but he eventually finds his way to Baltimore, where he is a cook in some cabin. Now, even though he's separated from Thomas Jefferson, you know, when Jefferson assumes the presidency, we have evidence that James is never too far from his mind. He wants James to be his chef while Jefferson is president at the White House, presumably to have a French chef would 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 bring to the White House a certain amount of prestige. And he certainly trusts James' ability to cook and cook well. So he's thinking why, instead of risking bringing someone else uh, whose expertise with French cooking might be questionable, I can bring James and I know just what he can do. He's trustworthy. So he tries to contact James Hemings to come to Washington, right? Now, the exchange here is not direct, but it's indirect. He conveys through uh, tavern owner William Evans. He, you know, they're going through an intermediary. Does this mean James is illiterate, can't write? Uh, perhaps. Or it just could be that um, James does not know, want Jefferson to know exactly where he's at. So Hemings conveys to Thomas Jefferson that he is willing to serve Jefferson before any other man in the Union. Those are exact words. Any other man in the Union, right? Jefferson does not quickly respond to this communication, right? He waits to hear, he wants to hear directly from Hemings. And this is some evidence that Hemings is literate or that, that he wants a more, a, a, a less mediated communication than the one that he has been getting. Now, so Jefferson's silent, Hemings is silent. We see a game of cat and mouse being played here. Who's the cat, who's the mouse? I'm sure each person thinks himself to be the cat, right? And thinks of the other to be the mouse. That, that just seems reasonable at this point. Um, so on March 31, 1801, Thomas Jefferson writes to tavern owner William Evans. And I read again, from the letter. So we have no direct communications. If you go to, to Jefferson's large correspondence, there are no words between James and Thomas, as there are between uh, James' half-brother, John, and uh, John Hemings and, and Thomas Jefferson. He writes to Evans, I suppose I saw in the difficulties raised by James an unwillingness to come here, arising wholly from some attachment he had formed in Baltimore, for I cannot suspect that an indisposition towards me. I can I concluded at once, therefore, not to urge him against inclination. In other words, he doesn't want to come here. I'm not going to force him. And wrote to Philadelphia, where I've been successful in getting a cook equal to my wishes. And I jump forward a little bit in the letter. I would wish James to understand that it was in acquiescence to what I supposed his own wish that I did not repeat my application after having so long requested on the expectation of having him. So Jefferson is saying, uh, communicating to James, you know, I want you to come here and ask you to come here. Uh, you're not readily responding and you're immediately responding. So as it is, I've got myself a French cook and it seems to me your silence is proof of your disinclination too. Uh, to be with me, to be my cook. So I got another one. Now, Evans, February 22, 1801. Um, it, no, I, I should say this in a prior letter to Evans, which is February 22, 1801, Jefferson expresses some reluctance to <clears throat> employ Hemings because of Hemings' disposition to drink. He might be a drunkard. Uh, Thomas writes to Evans, he says, the fear of his drinking and of his getting his family into distress by removing them induces me to wish rather that he would decline the thought. Jefferson doesn't want, he, he proposed that Jeff, that, that uh, Hemings join him in uh, in the presidency, right, at, uh, at, at Washington and become his, uh, um, his chef who specializes in French cuisine. And here he is uh, reneging. Right. He says, I'd, I'd rather not. He might be a heavy drinker. I don't need that around me. Um, all right. Now, he's talking about his family. What does that mean? Because James never weds. 
So there's no family. Jefferson presumably is just assuming that Jane has married and has wed. Shows you that the communications mediated and indirect um, are not sharing a wealth of knowledge about the, the goings on where each person is. Now, there are further you know, intermediary communications and Hemings does return to Monticello to, uh, for several weeks to function as chef when uh, Thomas returns to Monticello from Washington, right? Um, then there is after that, Hemings leaves again and um, it is November 5, 1801, and Evans writes to Thomas Jefferson, and I read from the letter. I received your favor on the first instance, Jefferson wrote to, to, uh, to um, Evans about Hemings on October, right, just prior to that, early October. I received your favor in the first instance, and I'm sorry to inform you that the report respecting James Hemings having committed an act of suicide was true. I made every inquiry at the time this melancholy circumstance took place, the result of which was that he had been delirious for some days previous to his having committed the act, and it was the general opinion that drinking too freely was the cause. Now, we, what is the cause here? So does he just drink himself to death? That seems quite unlikely, right? as uh, he's been delirious from some time. So he may, is he ill? And uh, during the illness, uh, with little prospect of, of recovery, he decides to commit suicide. The, we don't know, but we do know that, that we, I, I think it's easy to suspect that Hemings is on a drinking binge and he probably commits suicide while he's drunk. Uh, why does he kill himself? Right. I, I think it's highly unlikely that he just drinks so heavily he dies from drinking. It's it's presumed by Evans. I think there's a reason he kept, he gets drunk and commits suicide while he's drunk. So what is the reason? Let's look at what a couple other scholars say. Jack McLaughlin, in, in his book, Thomas Jefferson Monticello, the biography of the builder, writes, Jefferson's effort to discover the facts of Hemings' death suggests that he may have pondered his own role in the failure of a talented young man trapped between the races to survive as a free person. That doesn't seem too unreasonable. What the suggestion being is that, okay, he frees James. Maybe James wasn't so light-skinned and couldn't pass as white. And uh, it could be that there's the pressure of being a, a black person in white society and trying to get by and things, uh, though he's making an account of himself, he's passing the days, things aren't going so swimming. John Bowles, Thomas Jefferson, architect of American Liberty, writes that Hemings' refusal to write Jefferson until Jefferson formally writes him is a matter of pride, right? Jefferson refuses. So, I mean, we talk about the cat and mouse game. He's trying to explain the cat and mouse game, not so much the suicide, that Jefferson doesn't write because he's too proud to write him. It's beneath him to, to write to a slave, and it, it needs to be the, the freed slave who makes the first move. I think that's not right. Um, Thomas Jefferson's not that haughty and arrogant. He is maybe a little bit, but you know what? What Bowles is not taking into consideration is that Jefferson is president of the United States. There are things for him to do. It's not possible for him to drop everything that he's doing, and you know, go out and pen a letter to James. Where are you? Why aren't you here? Um, you know, Jefferson says on a number of occasions that, you know, the presidency and the burdens of office make it difficult to write to those people about whom I most care, you know, family members and friends. He's got to take care of official business. Uh, what is clear is that Jefferson is trying to communicate with James. And, you know, it's clear thereafter that he, when he inquires about James' suicide, he's heard the rumor and he finds out it's true that Jefferson is thinking about James, right? What was he thinking about? I mean, did being a free black man contribute to the delirium and his suicide? That's the point I suggested might be the case before. Whatever is the case, there it is clear that there seems to be 
strong paternal affection for Jefferson by James Emmons. So I asked a few questions here, a couple questions. Is the strong affection unrequited, unreturned by the Stoic Jefferson? In other words, maybe um, James has a paternal uh, affection towards Jefferson and Jefferson's affection to James is merely um, friendly, amicable. He doesn't look, him, look at him as a sort of son. He's just a friend. Um, now, James, we said this, refuses the right Jefferson. Jefferson refuses the right James. Does James kill himself because he feels like a forgotten son of Thomas Jefferson? Of Jefferson's big guy is president of the United States. You know, if Jefferson were to write him, it would show that he is a, a somebody. And But Jefferson's failure to write shows that Jefferson has forgotten him, doesn't care about him. So what I think is clear is the following. How are you doing, my name, Jeff? There is a strange ambivalence in the relationship. I've got to put on the heating pad for my little dog, Jefferson. Here. There is a strange ambivalence in the relationship between the two. The cat and mouse game shows that to be the case. Right? So, And it suggests that the following questions that I'm not going to answer for you, but I think are worth pondering. Why does Jefferson take James with him to France when he knows he's an irascible, uh, mercurial sort of person, one whose disposition might even be violent at times, proven by the attack, right, uh, in, in Paris? Why does Jefferson want James to return to Monticello when he's free, you know, once James gets free? And a final question, is the tension between Thomas Jefferson and James, question we already asked, part of the reason for James' suicide? And a, a final question is just how viscerally does James' suicide influence Thomas Jefferson? Everybody talks about, you know, everybody denigrates Jefferson and says, this guy refused to free his slaves, you know. Uh, and, he, and when he died, he only frees a handful. And, and that's disgusting. And as I said before, there's the larger question asked, where are they going to go? This episode of James' suicide suggests probably weighed heavily on Thomas, and he felt bad about giving him his freedom. That's, I can't, I don't know that. But I, I, I think it's very plausible that, you know, had I been in his shoes, I would have thought the same. Well, you know. Uh, maybe he would have been better staying here and me not agreeing to free him because his life th thereafter was short and hellish. So I end with the final thought here. You know, there's a lot of printer's ink spent on talking about Jefferson's avowed relationship with Sally Hemings. It never happened, as far as I'm concerned. And yet volumes and volumes and volumes are written on that, there's this really interesting relationship between Thomas Jefferson and James Hemings, and yet no one really has done much with that, right? No one has large concern for uh, greater disclosure about that relationship between Thomas Jefferson and, uh, and James Hemings. So I, I offer these sort of things. I sort of wish more people would, you know, I'm, I'm playing with this. And I, I, I've said what I have to say, and perhaps it's not much, but it's enough to, I hope, incite further scholars to, to take my baton and, and, and run with it. My, my pen, take my baton and run with it and, and do what they can't do to, um, to um, you know, further our understanding of the relationship, this complex, this, this torturous, this uh, raucous relationship between Thomas Jefferson and his slave, uh, James Hemmings. Okay, that's what I have to say. I'm going to say TTFN for now, and uh, we will see you at a future time. Thank you, and have a great afternoon.